Welcome back to the most news in the morning. Iran pushing its aggression and America's patience. This morning, Tehran test firing two types of long range missiles that have the potential to threaten American troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's a defiant show of force by a regime accused of building a covert uranium enrichment facility and comes just days before the U.S. holds its first diplomatic talks with Iran in 30 years. Joining me now is Jim Walsh. He's an international security analyst at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Jim, great to see you this morning. The, the Secretary of Defense was asked about uh, all of this uh, over the weekend, about where this is all headed. Let's listen to a little bit of what, what he said here. The Iranians are in a very bad spot now because of this deception in terms of all of the great powers. Uh, and there obviously is the opportunity for uh, severe additional sanctions. The opportunity for severe additional sanctions here. My question, Jim, to you this morning is how much of a real threat is this nuclear facility and how much is it just a reason for the United States and some of the other countries of the world to try to pursue these aggressive sanctions against Iran? Well, John, it's a good question. I think it's a little bit of both. On the one hand, any time a country is not transparent, forthcoming about its nuclear facilities, that's unwelcome. That raises questions about Iran's intentions. But if you step back and look at the big picture, it doesn't really fundamentally change the trajectory that Iran is on. So now we know they have 3,000 more centrifuges. Now those are under, going to be under IAEA safeguards. A and in the big picture, it doesn't mean that they're going to get a bomb any faster if, they, if that's what they want to do. Or it doesn't mean they've decided to go for the bomb. It means they still want a bomb option. Now on the sanctions, uh, obviously, if you can get all the parties to agree uh, and to be more resolute, it improves your negotiation position. And I think that's part of what's going on here. Going into these crucial October 1st talks, these revelations help pull the, the parties, Russia, China, the U.S., and others, uh, more t to be on the same page. Yeah, last week at the U.N. General Assembly, when President Obama met with uh, Russian President Dmitry, Dmitry Medvedev, we heard uh, Medvedev say the right thing, saying, well, sometimes sanctions are inevitable. But how likely is it that Russia, which wants to continue to do business with Iran, and particularly China, which has got some, uh, some pretty tight agreements with the Iranian regime, how likely is it that they would sign on to a new round of sanctions? Well, John, I think they might, if you get Russia, you'd probably get China. China doesn't want to be out there on a limb by itself. But, but the fundamental question is, if you could get any sanction you wanted, would the sanctions by themselves be enough to get Iran to uh, change course, mm -hmm. to reverse itself on what is a very public commitment by them to enrichment? I think the answer to that is no. Sanctions are part of the process. They help give incentives to negotiate, but not to capitulate. So if we put all our eggs in the sanctions basket, we're going to come up losers. Sanctions are a part of it, but they're not the most important part. At the end of the day, those negotiations are the most important part of what's going and on. And a big question, too, Jim, is how tough do you get with these sanctions? Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu uh, telephoned the Speaker of the House and several other lawmakers at the end of last week saying that Israel would like to see, quote, crippling sanctions leveled against Iran. But, but how far can you go before those crippling sanctions affect the Iranian people as opposed to the Iranian regime and how likely would it be that countries like France and Germany sign on to a regime like that? Well, I don't think they would sign on to that regime. I don't think people are going to suddenly tomorrow stop buying Iranian oil, uh, you know, not in this world economy. Uh, number two, we saw dur during the Iraq experience that broad sanctions can have a devastating impact mm -hmm. on the civilian population. But we're not, we're never going to get those. The real deal here is what's going to happen. This is the first time ever, John, in 30 years that American negotiators are going to sit down with Iranian negotiators in the same room for serious talks. And the question is, can we carve a way where we come out of that with a deal where they get to have some sort of nuclear program, some sort of mm -hmm. civilian mm -hmm. nuclear program, but that we get what we need in terms of assurances so we know it's not being misused for military purposes. Right. So That's they, the center of gravity. Yeah, that word safeguards, which is what the Secretary of, uh, of State was talking about. Give us a little personal perspective here, Jim. You, you, you happen to have uh, dinner with Ahmadinejad uh, last week in a, in a group setting. It's the fourth time that you have uh, met with him. Was he any different this time around than the previous three? Yes, John, I, he was different. I mean, uh, this is, I've spent like 15 hours in these meetings. You get different uh, Ahmadinejads. One year he was very uh, angry and defiant. Another year, he was more professorial. This year, it was the most conciliatory that I've seen him. He had positive things to say about the P5 
plus one talk, said they could be useful, said they were an opportunity, uh, said that the U.S. and uh, Iran could both take advantage and try to resolve them through these talks. So that was striking and different this time around. Yeah, just for folks who might not be familiar, P5, the uh, permanent five yeah. members of uh, the U.N. Security Council plus one Germany. So, Jim, it's great to talk to you this morning. Thanks so much. Really appreciate you coming in. Thank you, Jim. All right, thanks.